Hi, and uh, welcome to Complete and Cast, the official podcast for Complete and Box video games. Today in episode 47, we are talking about the current state of streaming video games and speedrunning. Now, today we're joined by a special guest way out in Nebraska. You may remember him from episodes 16 and 17. I know, right? 16 and 17, the best episodes. We have Michael Kenny, the whole way out in Nebraska. Michael, how are you doing? Hey, we're doing good. What's up, guys? Listen, we're here to talk about speedrunning. And when I started to uh, think about the idea for this, Michael was the first person that I know personally who does a little bit of speedrunning uh, like me. I do very, very amateur speedrunning. I do it once every like week or two because I don't have all that all that time. And Michael, you, you've done a fair share of uh, speedrunning in, in, in your past, correct? Yeah, we speedrun the same series at least <laughs> yeah Re Re resident evil i do i do resident evil 3 so Re resident evil the remake for the gamecube or i guess the 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 re-release for the pc that that was your big game right yeah it was the quickest game i could think of that didn't have any rng and i really wanted a game where i could sit down and beat in like one hour and uh, for anyone listening out there, RNG is essentially random number generator. It's a way of saying random stuff that happens during the game. And for any of you out there who actually do follow speedrunning, uh, speedrunners do not like randomness in the game. They like to learn the game and master it and not have random stuff happen. Which is ironic that um, Michael brought that up because Resident Evil 3, the, the game that I play, has um, the most RNG you could possibly have. It, oh yeah, that's the most of any game I can, well, not the most of any game, but man, for it, Resident Evil by far. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous, and it's half of the reason I can't really play it uh, too much in a row. Um, so, Michael, just uh, real quick before we go into speedrunning in general, r roughly how long in terms of a, a time frame did you speedrun, and what was your, not time-wise, but I guess place-wise, your, your, your best um, uh, f fitting in there? Well, Resident Evil was the first time I ever streamed speedrunning, but before that I was really into time trialing F Zero, if that counts, on sure. the Super Nintendo. <laughs> and you would you would like you, you would send them in, right? Yeah, because back in those days, um you would actually have to record your button inputs on ZSNES, the emulator, and send the uh, like the ZSNES file in. But nowadays, with the advent of more websites and more technology, you can actually record these and send them in. That's what I ended up doing with Resident Evil. Well, that actually brings me straight into our overall, you know, overview and history of this. So. Let's actually get started into the uh, to the program proper. So, for a very brief um, speedrunning history, speedrunning has been around pretty much as long as video games have been around. Although it hasn't gotten really popular, really, really popular until the last, I would say, two to three years. You could maybe say five years, but generally around the 2013 to 2015 range is when it really, really um, took off. So most modern speedrunning as we knew it actually started out as Quake speedruns, the, the PC game Quake. Uh, there was a website that eventually became known as Speed Demos Archive that was pretty much only Quake time trials, just like Michael said he did F-Zero time trials. And that was the way that it was for, for years and years before Twitch uh, was a thing. Michael, uh, back in the day, did you ever go to Speed Demos Archive? Actually, I I didn't go to speed demos for the longest time, but I didn't, I knew of it. But I would say I didn't go to it until like late two thousands. So I missed a lot of like the really nitty gritty history because the F zero time trials were on a separate website. Well, you know the the, the mid two thousands was definitely where it was um, booming. Yeah. And um, it, it was a very neat website. There was no Twitch, and there really wasn't too much YouTube. So this was the only place you could really see people beating these games really quick. Um, very long story short, essentially, you would send in a VHS tape of 
um, you playing the game, and it would take weeks, if not months, to be verified and put up on the website. And again, this is pretty early uh, mainstream internet, so it was definitely the bee's knees as 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 far as that was uh, far as that was all concerned. Not anything like it is nowadays. Um, they even had uh, eventually you could order DVDs of your favorite. Uh, I never did this, but I thought about it of your favorite speed runs. Um, because so few people speed run back in the day that it, uh, it felt like a lot of these records were not going to ever be broken. They were up for years and years and years. And, um, that's just kind of how they, how, how it was back then. Yeah. Records would stand for years at that point. Yeah. I mean, it, it and again, there weren't that many people doing it. So it was just such a niche niche hobby that did not have a lot of people doing it now i'm not exactly sure when we're going to be able to fit this into the uh to to our conversation today so let's really quickly talk about twin galaxies which i think is a uh, you brought this up michael i think it's a very fascinating uh subject twin galaxies is, is essentially the leaderboard for all things arcade games and all things very retro games it's not about beating games quickly it's about getting the highest score on the games um made pretty famous in the documentary king of kong uh michael do you have any experience with twin galaxies or any silliness with that yeah i, I had more experience with that because twin galaxies actually was the one who worked with f-zero actually more than speed demos i don't know why they occasionally would dabble in time trials instead of high score games so they're the ones that I worked with the most. And the funny thing, looking back on it, back back in the day in the mid-2000s, um, Twin Galaxies was looked at as the most hardcore place to put your your um, scores into. Um, many times they would, they would uh, request that you actually go and get the high score where, where they are, up, up in, uh, I think it's uh, New Hampshire or Vermont. It's, 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 somewhere, it's somewhere northeast. Yeah. And they would oftentimes, for seemingly very little reason, um, decline runs uh, because they felt that there was, uh, you know, cheating involved. Which obviously, Michael, makes uh, what happened over the last year very ironic. Yes. <laughs> uh, essentially, for, you know, <laughs> I don't expect this to be common knowledge, Billy Mitchell, the Pac-Man and Donkey Kong guy who has the tie and the mullet and the uh, hot sauce was found out through internet sleuthing to absolutely be uh cheating on games uh he was always you know it's like us it's like barry bonds was always an amazing baseball player but he had to take steroids to to get that you know exact small edge right there and and people proved without a shadow of the doubt through like literally like reverse engineering that billy mitchell and a few other very very prominent arcade players were absolutely 100 percent cheating and it kind of turned um, the high score scene uh, over on on its head. Yeah, it's uh, it was like a pretty big co-conspirator type thing where the entire like Twin Galaxy staff was kind of covering for several of these high profile figures. So yeah, they don't really have a hub anymore for for the Donkey Kongs or. Pac-Man is kind of sad. It's just kind of interesting how it's like such a niche small thing. Like even me as a hardcore game person, I'm like not very interested in a lot of high score stuff. And yet it like it's almost like a like a mafia kind of thing or like a like a deep state government kind of thing. It's like, oh well, we 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 take care of our guys. You know what I mean? It's it's just like it's very bizarre the lengths that that they went to. Um definitely for anyone out there, I suggest checking out um just anything you can read on 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 the cheating. Uh, that was just found out. My favorite example, uh, Michael. I forget the guy's name, but did you hear about the whole dragster uh, for Atari yes. controversy? I forget the guy's name. He's he's such a slimy, just looking, just just look at him, and he looks like a slimy dude who cheats at everything. Essen totally. Essentially, for like thirty years, he had this record on dragster. It's a literal six second game on Atari where you like have to like it's like a drag race. You have to like press the button at the exact right time to. Um, change gears and the, the race is over in like seven seconds 
And for the longest time, he had this record that no one could beat. And then people literally reverse engineered with the ROM file of the game and found out that the time that he sent in was physically impossible, even by a computer doing it perfectly. And I think that's an amazing use of re reverse engineering, yeah. quite frankly. <coughs> It, it, it's just it, it, it's just fantastic how that ended up working out. So we're going we're going over to present day um, with things like Twitch. And for those of you who don't know, Twitch.tv used to be Justin.tv. I'm bringing you back. I'm bringing you back, aren't I, Michael? That definitely was when I first even heard of streaming video games. I think was just the Justin in general. And it's, it sounds, if I were to come up to you five years ago and say, hey, there's these people who, for their jobs, eight hours a day, five days a week, just stream them playing video games and trying to beat records, you would probably say, what? Are you serious? And yeah. over these last five years, it's really, 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 really grown. There were, you know, uh, the, the general invention of everyone having, like, fast, high-speed internet, everyone having, like, internet on their phones has really helped. But it's really become its own um, subgenre. I mean, Michael, let me let me ask you first before we get into anything too too uh, deep. You watch Twitch and you watch it a fair share, correct? Yeah, I mean, I would say I watch Twitch more than any other form of like video entertainment, cable, or even YouTube, probably. And I, I, I can't disagree with you there. I, I, I'm fully on board. I'm probably equal with that and, like, sports stuff. But simply the fact that, like, it's available. I have, like, eight or ten people that I follow. And given the time of the day, if I have a little bit of time, there's pretty guarantee that's, that, that, that someone's going to be on. A lot of these people um, keep very rigid, rigorous um, schedules. Uh, do you have any particular games that you uh, enjoy watching on Twitch more than anything else? A lot of it is uh, kind of fighting game streamers I'll end up watching, but there's a few speedrunners in there that I still watch. I I love Legend of Zelda speedrunning. Watching it is is the best. Oh, I can't disagree with all with all the different glitches and stuff. So you and me come from a different a different side here. I generally only watch. I would say everyone that I watch speedruns, although I do enjoy like their casual stuff, it's mostly speedrunning. Whereas you seem to do more of like the tournaments and the events and stuff like that that they that they stream anyway. Yeah, but it, it, a lot of the fighting game content producers I watch on a regular basis kind of just play everything, so it turns into like kind of just a like, more casual stream in general. I, I mean, that's that, that's definitely goes to show you how much like different content there is out here on Twitch. So yeah. compared to five, 10 years ago, all you really need nowadays to be a Twitch streamer is a webcam and a PC that's set up with, with a capture card to be able to capture what you're doing. And in fact, there's some pretty decent streamers out there that don't even use webcams, although they generally do have at least their voice on. Um, a guy I watch a bit, um, his name's uh, ZFG, Zelda Freak Guy. He's the um, world record holder, not going to have time. He doesn't even have a webcam, and he is one of the most popular guys on Twitch. There, so there's a lot of different ways you can uh, go about it. Um, oh, yeah. There... You don't even have to be a person with a personality. Like, Siglemic wouldn't even talk to the stream for <laughs> the entire stream and have 4,000 people just watching. Yeah, and let's actually go into that real quick. I would say that there's two people who really brought uh, speedrunning to the mainstream. That would be Sig Lemic, who played Mario 64, and he was the best in the world at the time, and Cosmo Wright, who did a lot of, um, I believe he did Twilight Princess back in the, or, I'm sorry, uh, Wind Waker. Wind Waker. Wind, Wind, Wind Waker back in the day. Um, and... Sig Lemic, as Michael mentioned, was a very specific example. As you mentioned, Michael, he would not say a single word on stream sometimes. Yeah, he set, like, the the way to even stream that game because I remember Punkation, who's another Super Mario 64 runner, he started out also no webcam and would say nothing. And then, like, three years later, if you watch his streams now, he's, like, the most gregarious guy <laughs> 
I mean, it, 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 it definitely goes to show you when Sig Lemic was around, there wasn't many high profile streamers there, so there wasn't much to watch. Nowadays, with so many people out there, you really, I, to me, if I'm going to watch you, you have to at least have somewhat of an interesting personality. Um, the only way I would go against that is if you were the absolute best in the world at the game that you were playing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I would say out of the people I follow, most of them have at least decent personalities. I like Caleb Hart. He does uh, Mega Man games. And even though he's not like the world record holder in any of those, he's definitely interesting enough that it's um, it ends up working out okay uh, for him. Um, totally. And a lot of these people, Michael, um, you know, some of these people like you and me do it very part-time and make no money and don't want to make any money out of it. But a lot of these people do this as, as full-time jobs. Yeah, people can clear, like, <laughs> half a million dollars with Twitch bucks. <laughs> it's it's crazy. And um, to to go into that real quick, you might be thinking, well, how do they make money from doing this? And that's a good question. There's a lot of people that I've watched many, many times that I've never given a single cent to. Essentially, there are two ways they can make money. They can, uh, you can donate straight to them. You can say, hey, Caleb Hart, here's 20 bucks. Or you can subscribe to them. Essentially, subscribing to them only gives you a couple benefits. Like in chat, you get a couple extra um, emotes. Um, but you don't have to, to get pretty much everything out of it. But people go out of their way still to subscribe michael do you subscribe to anyone on twitch i i don't anymore but i for two straight years subscribed to one of the one of my favorite streamers and what was what was your rationale for um doing that he is just like the most entertaining guy and like at the time he wasn't like big at all i remember like he would clear like 300 viewers so it kind of felt like yeah dude have some money like five bucks twitch takes half of that like so 250 <laughs> you can uh you can have my 250 so i don't know and now it just is like has blossomed for him to where he's like making a steady living and it's, it's kind of cool to see that like someone who has worked so hard like actually make it doing what he's passionate about well and that's and that's the thing i've i've seen a lot of people on twitch when um because it's so popular nowadays a lot of people want to get into it and boy is it hard to get into it nowadays um i've seen a lot of popular streamers that that always average three to five hundred viewers say i went months before getting a single viewer you know like like a constant single viewer and you just have to go at it and just do it every single day and just hope that it catches on somehow and hope that you're doing something to separate yourself from everyone else. And it is not easy. It is not easy. It's such a saturated market. Yeah, it's it, I feel like it becomes like double saturated every year. Like I couldn't think it could become more. And then it just is is insane. Well, I mean, a great example. I was watching one. one He's a mid-tier guy I watch. Like I said, he gets about three, 400 viewers uh, a stream. And some guy came in and was like, how do I get into streaming? I want to make money off of this. And it's like, dude, if that's your like way of looking into this, it ain't happening. It ain't happening. Totally. Because, I mean, it's to the point where most people can watch a stream and know where your heart is, kind of. Oh, yeah. If that I, makes sense. No, I totally agree with you. It's... um. A lot of these guys have to go out of their way, like, and do a lot of stuff, like, on the side, like, get graphics made and, and just really focus on, on what's going on in their channel. And you actually segued into my, into my next, um, to my next topic. So back in the day with Sig Lemic, he never talked at all once, but now that the market is so saturated, a lot of these guys have to go out of their way to really like it's like a different kind of focus on stream uh michael can you explain a little bit about twitch chat so i mean it's a pretty it can be a very vile place but essentially a lot of twitch chats turn into like a community where you know without the streamer none of these people would even know each other like it's, it's a really interesting dynamic 
No, and that's and that's a and that's a good way of looking at it. A lot of the people that I watch, like I'll if they're not huge, like Caleb Hart is huge and has twenty five people twenty five hundred people watching every time. But a lot of times for the mid level guys, I'll see the same names there in chat. And it's like it's almost like it become a their own subculture with this with this channel itself. Yeah, it's actually I would say that's like fifty percent of the entire experience is that culture you get around it which is built organically and that's the trouble a lot of people have is you can only view bot so much and you know view botting is paying people to artificially inflate your stream number because at some point you have to have people actually chatting in chat and getting excited and enjoying what you're doing because then otherwise no one's going to subscribe no one's going to give you money if i went to a place and saw a thousand people watching and it was just boring i wouldn't continue to watch no absolutely not i mean half the fun yeah is just watching people's reactions and because of that these twitch these uh streamers have to really be paying attention like at all times like i notice a lot of the guys they they almost pay more attention to the chat than they do their actual game even if it's a little bit of a hindrance to their gameplay because you have to keep your demographic happy like at all times when they're talking totally and that's why i think it would be way too difficult to to juggle an actual speed running career and a twitch career simultaneously but that's what a lot of these people have to do, and it's just it's yeah. it's very interesting. It's it's gone a far way since Sig Lemic just sat there quietly for eight hours. Now, if somebody did that, it's like no one would watch for any reason. There's just no way if someone just sat there. I've I've turned off many channels when I'm just like this dude. This dude's boring. The only way, like I said, that I'll continue watching is if he's like the best in the world at the game. But there's only one of those. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really wish some speedrunners would be quiet, for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can feel you there. So, we just went over quickly how big Twitch has become and how big like this different streaming is uh, has become. Due to that, the nature of speedrunning has become absolutely nuts. Michael, can you uh, start into that really quick? Uh, sorry, I missed the question. Oh, so just saying how uh, there are so many like streamers out there now that speedrunning as a quote-unquote sport or activity has become even crazier. Oh, yeah. it's. I mean, if you watch, there is a kind of a Woodstock for speedrunning now. And you just look at the numbers on that and you can tell how much it's blossomed and how many people actually speedrun now. Oh, it's, I mean, and you're talking about games done quick, which most people in the gaming industry know nowadays. Five years ago, I believe it was 2013, it, it might have been 2012, maybe six years ago, they were hosting it in somebody's basement. And yeah. now it's so big that they have to run out these huge convention halls to even host all the people that go to it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> barometer of speedrunning's viability is just the gargantuan size of games done quick now versus just three or four years ago yeah it was it was it was nothing by comparison imagine if like the nfl started today and then in five years had like a super bowl with eighty thousand people at it like it's it's that insane how fast it has grown yeah absolutely i do think they uh i don't know where speedrunning goes now that they have this audience because it seems like they should be able to rent out like an a quote-unquote esports arena or you know i don't know how that would work honestly with just one player on the on the screen really well i mean we've seen already that there's been huge arenas where people play like multiplayer games exactly like i i'm wondering if that would be viable since you know evo is at the mandalay bay now and the dota and league of legends finals are in these enormous arenas now as well i mean if it's gonna move anywhere from there it would definitely that would definitely be the next step it's hard to believe yeah. that that would be the case to see somebody like play like a four hour ocarina of time speed run but like i mean yeah, no, no one 
dynamic. No one would have guessed five years ago that they would be hosting these huge events at like big hotels, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even then it's, they've grown enormously. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely nuts. So going another part into speed running is the actual like speed running records, the fastest times, Michael, back then with Speed Demos Archives and stuff like that, the, the record turnaround was a lot slower. Am I correct? Yes. So back back then, I specifically remember a lot of speedruns, um, like the, the, the world records lasting for years and years. Whereas nowadays, I've seen certain world records beat like in a couple days. Yeah. It, it, I... I want to say that the that's another thing that's changed a lot in the culture as well as back in the day there wasn't as many people searching for these glitches there wasn't people searching for strats necessarily they kind of came on slowly the discovery wasn't like you didn't have thousands of people writing task programs to figure out how to do this part exactly correctly you know so it's everything's accelerated so far no, you're 100% correct. With all these people trying to find all these different glitches and strategies for playing the game, um, I mean, one happened recently in Final Fantasy VII where they figured out um, early on in the game you can do this skip that skips like 20 minutes of the game. And that changed everything. All Final Fantasy VII speedrunners were suddenly like, well, we're back to square one. Now everyone knows this um, this, this strategy. Now let's go. Let's, let's, let's set a new record. Yeah, it there's so many like that's the most exciting time in speedrunning now because instead of it being like i can beat this game faster than you it's like now we all are on a new playing field of glitches and strategies which is it's the same but a really different dynamic i think michael another very interesting dynamic that i see is the the fact that everybody in the community is so nice and inclusive I have to be honest, like, so if I found a glitch for a game and I knew it was going to help me set the world record, even if I was only going to have it for a week, I would, like, totally not share it, right? Am yeah. I am I in the same... Are you in the same boat with me here? Yeah, and I, I, I think that does happen, but not as often as you, you would think in speedrunning. It's more... Well, that's another thing is the, a lot of the people who find the glitches don't speedrun the game, interestingly enough, I found out. <laughs> They are just interested in finding new strategies to help the speedrunners. No, you're right. Um, I, it's still so amazing, like how close these communities are. Uh, for instance, I watch a guy who does Pokemon uh, speedruns once in a while, and like everybody I see in his chat are like, say he's doing Pokemon Red now, right? Like you'll see throughout the course of one of his streams, like the other top five like world record holders in that in that in that game, like the top five on the list, will all be like talking on his thing, and he'll be like, "Oh hey, um, do you remember what I do here?" And then the guy who's in like third place will be like, "Yeah yeah, you you do this, you gotta press up three times or whatever." And it's just amazing how inclusive and how nice they are on that like. If I was, like, that close to a world record, I would, like, totally not be like, yeah, let me just tell you what to do here. It's fine. Totally. I think I think that is interesting because they're not necessarily going against each other. It's almost like they're going against the game. So I can see why there's kind of that camaraderie. Yeah, it, and it's it's. I didn't even think of bringing it up, uh, but it's it's a fascinating, like you said, um, just like friendship that's come over. Like the, maybe the only thing they have in common is the fact that they want to want to uh, break the time on this game. But it's not so much to them about oh, I want world record to like I want the time to be less. I want to I want somebody to push the record down to beat the game more. Totally. And that's why you'll hear a lot of speedrunners when they get like this crazy new record. They're like, this game is done. This game is done. That's a big thing. Oh, they'll say it's like optimized or whatever. Yeah. Like they'll. <laughs> that <laughs> they've kind of conquered that particular speed run when in reality, I mean, new glitches are going to be found m weeks after they do that. That's got to be the frustrating thing to, like, 
<clears throat> grind this game to oblivion and then have the world record and then a week later someone finds this crazy glitch that saves two minutes and you're like at that point like you work so hard to get that two minutes off but at that point joe schmo could pick it up and and beat your old time simply because of this new strategy it's got to be very frustrating oh yeah Ocarina of time is definitely just like that it seems like that game can go no lower every time, but somehow they shave 30 seconds off it every six months. Well, I mean, they they just, a couple weeks ago, figured out one that does, like, five minutes off. Um, for anyone out there, I find that Ocarina of Time 100% speedrun is the craziest run possible out there. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything is done in such a weird, random order. Every two, I swear, every two minutes of that run, you'll be going, what the heck did he just do? Like, it's just so fascinating. Yeah. Like, I, I, that's why I like Ocarina so much for speedrunning in general, because all of the categories are really fun to watch. Well, that's another thing, and let me get into that real quick. There are so many people speedrunning that nowadays, it used to be like, you would just beat, you know, Ocarina of Time, and that was it. Nowadays, there's all these different subcategories you know, because people have grinded, um, let's say, any percent, which is beat the game as fast as you can, they'll move it over to, like, other categories, defeat all dungeons, defeat no dungeons, get 100% of everything. So, it, in a way, that definitely does make everything fresh. You can play the same dang game and do it, like, eight different ways, and it does feel, in a way, like a different game. Totally. Like... I can't imagine what the people who made those games think about it. <laughs> yeah, it just must... I mean, it must in one way be like, it's amazing people are still playing this game so much, but at the same time, it's like, did you have to break it so much? <laughs> That's just hilarious. I... Go ahead. Yeah, like, if you watch the Any% percent Ocarina run, it is... You can barely tell it's Legend of Zelda in parts. Yeah, it's like a 20-minute speed run to beat the game, and that would obviously be impossible without a crazy warp. That's actually one of the arguments I get into. Like, a glitch for me is like a broken game where, like, you just walk into a wall and it goes away. Like, a lot of these games, people have played them so much and had computers simulate them so much that, like, I don't find them to be glitches necessarily if you have to, like, open up the source file to find, like... A code that isn't exactly correct <laughs> yeah a lot of the wrong like they call it wrong warp and it's basically getting the game to mess up and send you to a different area than you should be a lot of those glitches tend to alienate some people and the, the any percent ocarina run uses a wrong warp which sends you from the lost forest all the way to ganon so nowadays when you are if you're if you're starting out and you're like i'm gonna pick a game and i'm gonna speed run it chances are if it is a video game and if it can be beaten in a certain time obviously madden can't be beaten in a certain time there's likely somebody out there or multiple people out there who have played this game into oblivion um, oh, yeah. For instance, the other day I was like, you know, I just want to put another time up on the leaderboards and I don't really care what it is. So I was looking through for some Nintendo game that would take me like 10 minutes, right? I beat it in 10 minutes and I'm like 50th place, right? Like whatever, at least I have a time up there. So I picked Little Mermaid, right? <laughs> some random Nintendo game, uh, Little Mermaid. I went to the speedrun leaderboards, and it is amazingly optimized. There are, like, hundreds of people on the leaderboard. Like, the guy in first place was like, I can't believe I finally knocked that last second off. I can't believe I did it. After months, I finally did it. I have the world record in, in Little Mermaid for Nintendo. Isn't that just amazing, Michael? Yeah, you can pick any game. Like, Corey in the House on GBA. Guarantee that has an optimized speedrun. And that's not to say it's every single game, but a lot of games, like, I've sat here in my game room and just kind of looked at some really obscure titles I have, and I'll type it in a, into speedruns.com, and sure enough, there'll be three or four people, and, like, the first place will be like, uh, it's not optimized, but it's the best I want to do for now, and it's, like, four minutes better than everyone else, and you're just like, it's just amazing how many people are doing this nowadays. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that is, like, a thing to do, is, like, people 
kind of go to some lesser known titles to try to like cut their teeth a little bit so everyone's looking for that like unexplored territory now let's talk about our very last subject today which is grinding in video games um in speed running uh grinding is one of the most important things if you're going to be a high level runner uh michael do you want to explain grinding real quick yeah i mean grinding in in anything is just going way above and beyond and learning every single aspect of something like repetitiously to where it, you can do it on command every time and of course doing it over and over and over again over. if you mess up 30 seconds in you restart if you mess up 40 minutes in you restart yeah it those games that have like 10 minute intros before you get to the actual game for speedrunning must be so horrible <laughs> oh my god i mean resident evil 3 has a one minute intro and i hate it it's one minute and i'm like dude just start me some games like like wind waker for gamecube for the longest time was like a 30 minute intro where like there was just all this dumb stuff you have to do to start the game and every time you restarted you had to do that whole intro again it must have been terrible <laughs> yeah so those those people who have to grind through that and just repetitiously train and train and train through those conditions, I have complete respect for. It has, to, it has to be so mentally tiring. I mean, I play Resident Evil 3 for like 45 minutes and I'm like, I'm done. Like, I get one run done and I'm like, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And like, they're most streamers, uh, the speedrun streamers, will have their little time thing and it will say how many runs they've done before that and it will always be like in the five thousands or higher <laughs> oh it's the pokemon guy i watch his his pokemon yellow one which was the one he was looking for the longest time was like five thousand and that's not a really you don't restart pokemon that fast you know i mean i have 90 restarts on resident evil 3 and some of those quite frankly are like 10 seconds into the game and I'm still like, damn, I play that game a lot. You know, it's yeah. just, it's it's crazy. Well, let me give you a real-life example of grinding uh, for, for the viewers and Michael. So when I started playing Resident Evil 3, my, my first goal was to get under uh, one hour. And that took me a couple weeks of just playing very casually. And then eventually I just had a run where I didn't die. And, you know, I did the standard strategies and I got like un under an hour, right? So, <laughs> after playing it for a couple more weeks or months, and again, just, just to be fair, I only play it maybe one hour a week. It's, it's not too much. I was able to grind the time down from an hour to right under 50 minutes. I currently sit at 49.53, which is like 60th place or something. The world record is a little over 41 minutes. Now... I was able to really... My first run was like an hour 20. I was able to, to knock a half hour off like nothing, right? I'm down to 50 minutes. I've been on that 49 minutes for like two months. It's... When you get to a certain part, it's so hard to optimize it. And I still have nine, eight minutes I can save on that. And I'm, st I'm already to the point where I'm like grinded out of that game. Can you imagine doing that for, like, a game where, like, every second counts, Michael? No, not at all. I mean, it comes down to the frame sometimes. It's it's really mentally taxing, I would imagine. Like, even I played a Resident <laughs> Evil, the remake. I chose it because I could door skip, which, ugh, I couldn't imagine playing Resident Evil without a door skip. Agreed. And I used the mode that had rocket launcher immediately unlocked so you could just breeze through the game but it still like had so many like really frame perfect optimized strategies so you would have to save state and just try those things over and over again until it was like complete muscle memory and that's when the game starts getting a little bit you know, I don't want to say unfun, but you have to really have your heart in it. Well, just like anything else in, in, in life, when it becomes your job, in a certain way, it becomes a little less fun. Absolutely, yeah. That's why I really enjoy the people who obviously still have fun playing their games. I mean, ZFG, Zelda, Zelda Freak Guy, has like 
played predominantly Ocarina of Time for like 10 years. Now, granted, again, they're always finding new stuff, so it's like a different strategy, but like, he's played almost only Ocarina of Time, at least on stream, for like 10 years, and he still absolutely loves it. Like, he can't stop talking about it during the stream. Totally. It, like, when you get to that level, it definitely becomes like you know the the MOBA genre and the fighting game genre where it's actually like competition and you thrive on that out it, it's not so much about the game it's about more the community the culture the competition you know absolutely and like j just to just to finish this off with a nice bow the people who grind these games like um Resident Evil 3 okay um, a couple of the top level guys that I watch, they do not play it all the time because it is a very mentally taxing game. It's really hard to explain. It's only, like I said, a 40, 45 minute run, but it's every second there's something there's something happening, right? And the main reset point in that game is an is a minute 30 into the game, and it requires heavily on randomness. <clears throat> and if you don't if you're a top level guy and you don't get the exact right rep randomness, an hour, uh, a minute 30 into the game, you reset. And Sad. then four minutes into the game, there's randomness between two weapons you get. And if you get the wrong weapon, you absolutely reset. And then again, 10 minutes in, there's a puzzle that if you don't get the right randomness, you reset. So again, for a game like Resident Evil 3, when people do that, I like tip my hat because not only are you like, I played perfect, but the game didn't give me what I needed as well. The fact that people can still do that is amazing. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't possibly do that. Yeah, I I want to like like get maybe a minute more off of my time if like because I see I see it being possible if I have a good run that I can string together. I know that I can do it. It's not something where it's like I know that I could sit down one day and just do it because there are many places where I just lose a lot of time. But after that, it's like I'm done. I I don't have time. I don't have the patience or the energy to be able to do that. And absolute props to people who can. I don't know, man. It sounds like you got the bug, though. When you get that one minute down, you're going to cross it again. You're going to be down to 42. I mean, to be fair, I, I I originally said less than less than an hour. And then when I easily did that, I was like less than 55. And then I said less than 50. <laughs> so I, I feel what you're saying. But just knowing the time I have to play, I just know that it's going to reach a point where I'm like, I'm done. You know, I just that's the one thing about doing it full time. At least you can do it full time. Yeah, if you actually aren't running a video game store, which is the best video game store in the humble state of Lancaster. Is, is that how you say it, Lancaster? L L Lancaster, yeah. I mean, I would hope that if, if someone would be listening to this podcast the whole way through, I would hope they would at least like us a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let me finish this off real quick with, with asking you, Michael, and you kind of hinted on this already a little bit. Where do you see speedrunning going in the future? Um, do you see positive or do you see negative as we continue? I'm really curious about that because it. I always want to say that it's reaching and some, something's going to happen, but I. it seems like the people who speedrun and watch speedruns want it to remain their thing you know they don't want necessarily sponsorships they don't want to get into arenas they want it more like a they want it to be their thing so i i think it's going to be in the next few years something's going to really budge in that area well i've already seen a couple of the streamers i watch being very minorly uh sponsored with stuff so that's already kind of starting yeah it's like there's you saw a little bit in all the other kind of electronic sports movements where people are resistant to change they don't really want like normal people quote unquote to watch their stuff and i i do feel speed runs in are in that mode where it's they're kind of butting heads with community leaders and such so I, i'm curious i i don't know where it'll go that's why i'm kind of fascinated I think as as long as the communities are as nice and inclusive as they are, I think it's gonna is gonna it's gonna keep around. The one thing that would kill it is if all of a sudden it started like closing up and like when someone came into a stream and was like, 
oh, why does this happen? Like, if they're just like, no, go away, we don't want you. Like, I feel like that could kill it, but I, I feel like otherwise it's it's going to stay around at least for its hardcore target demographic. Oh, yeah. As far as that, I don't think it will go away in our lifetimes even, to be honest, unless, you know, unless games somehow dry up, which <laughs> I could severely doubt. I, I doubt I doubt that's going to happen. So, yeah. hey, Michael, thank you very much for being on uh, uh, on, on again, uh, way out from Nebraska via uh, the CIB line, C- CIB Skype line. <laughs> CIB Skype line. Oh, Call baby. Speed dial. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Always, always on speed dial. So thank you again, Michael. And thank you again, everyone out there for listening. You have a good one. Yeah, have a good one, guys.